Thank you guys for coming today to this beautiful garden, this beautiful summer day at Greater Light. So today we have the honor of welcoming Beverly Hall again to Greater Light to, as her portrayal of Hannah Monahan, who she has um, sort of embodied for the last five years. Hannah has come to life through Beverly for us the last few years. So it's been a transformation and she has brought the house to life, the lives of the sisters, as well as the, the things that they accomplished here on Nantucket. So we are very honored to have her here today. So thank you so much for joining us. And now I introduce you to Beverly, AKA Hannah Monahan. Welcome to the house. I'm so happy to see you here on this beautiful afternoon. Sweeping always centers me, so I love to clean up this patio here. You know, it was once a pig pen. Can you believe this barn, this beautiful barn that we found in 1929? But let me tell you the story. There's so many things I want to share with you today. It's wonderful to have you here. And I can say that so many events in this tale happened decades ago. But now the time has come to share with others our view of heaven as we see it here here in this one spot. We're not talking about a locality, but a state of mind. Oh, it was over 80 years ago, my sister Gertrude was drawing some letters on a long wooden board, the name we had chosen for our house, Greater Light. Why, I can still hear that preacher reciting that passage from the Bible, Genesis it was. And God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. And today, as I sit here reading and reminiscing, I can see the evening shadows drifting across the lawn, the scent of peonies and lilies, huh, and the memory of so many friends and family sitting around this patio, a pig pen it once was, laughing and sharing their stories. Gertrude with a book on her lap, our greyhound, Angel Gabriel, curled up at her feet. This garden grew as we did. Why, look by those stone steps, our little juniper, once the size of a boot. <laughs> and now look at it. Why, it's a towering tree. Its branches provide grateful shade as well as keeping out the passers-by and the noises from the streets. We planted it with such care. In the old days, I could seldom step out of my house without a lot of peekers looking over the hedges and those cameras poking at me, so disconcerting. And yet, within our house and grounds, I feel such peace and quiet. Isn't it strange how two situations, two feelings can exist opposite each other? And yet, this house so captivated our imagination from the moment we saw it. Remember what you said, Gertrude, as you were packing your paints for our first trip to the island. You said, we just might find a barn someday. And now, look where we are. Remember that old weather-beaten man who said, any off-islander who buys that pig barn will be like a man sitting on a hornet's nest. <laughs> but we didn't listen, did we? We found that grocer on Main Street, and we persisted. Belongs to the old town, Mr. Holland said. But we love that barn, I blurted out. Well, my children, if you love it, I might sell it to you. And he did. Wouldn't we have been astounded if we could have seen the events and the turn of events then? The wall back there with the stone boulders, the kingfisher fountain, why? I found that tile in the thrift shop for only a dollar. <laughs> My, and of course, those magnificent gates. Look at them, 12 feet high, found in a junkyard in Philadelphia. I knew I had no place to put them, no place at all. And yet I knew I must have them. Their beauty must be ours. <sighs> Some might call this a mere folly, a supreme folly, our supreme folly. <laughs> My, how the town did talk and criticize us. All the taunts we endured, those who were for us and those who were against. 
No longer did we hear faint whispers drift across the fence. Storm clouds broke out all around us. Who ever heard of wrought iron gates or cutting a hole in the side of a barn? <laughs> it's preposterous, they said. <laughs> but some insisted genius, a stroke of sheer genius. <laughs> Why, it's sacrilegious, sacrilegious, but oh, so attractive, so attractive. <laughs> we will win in the end, I said to Gertrude. They will see the beauty in what we are doing. Divine mind knows if we just step aside and let it work. Remember what Keats said, beauty is truth, truth beauty. He must have had us in our house in mind when he wrote that phrase. I truly believe that art captures the eternal in the everyday. And each day as this house grew, oh, the power of those ideas came together like pieces in a puzzle. How much that virus called art has enriched our Quaker life, despite the Quaker upbringing and our parents' warning of, of too much decoration. We stubbornly persisted in creating our dream house. Why, we became positively drunk <laughs> with the joy of creating our home. And now look at all the beauty we are surrounded by. So many precious objects collected over so many years from so many different places. The rug our, break, our brother Jay brought back from the Southwest. The Russian samovar, those six golden pillars. <laughs> and that Chinese porcelain. No one can say that's not native to the island. Why, it came here on a clipper ship. How I do cherish all that we have been blessed with. And yet a question keeps rising up within me. Is it only what we see, the chairs, the faded fabric, the broken rug, the, the faded rug, the broken chair, which pass in time? Or is there something that lasts beyond the chair, the broken, the broken chair, the faded fabric, something that lasts as a symbol of our love, as part of eternal love? That eternal love we name God. <laughs> Gertrude always said, Hannah, you take yourself much too seriously. She liked to tease me, but we both knew the power of that love. <laughs> Why, when I was just 16, I was valedictorian of my class, and I chose a long poem by Shelley to recite before a large audience. It began... A sensitive plant in the garden grew. I did not recite that poem. I was that sensitive plant. To me, the closing line hit the mark. For love and beauty and delight, there is no death. Strange, isn't it? But it seems to me that time is but a limited view of eternity. The day we call today and the moment we call yesterday seems so very close. I know now that whatever turmoil we caused here really had nothing to do with us. It was a crash between the complacent past and the oncoming era, instead of a gradual awakening to the inevitable change. <laughs> the reaction to the house today is, well, <laughs> amusing, really. Informative, of course, but I dare say it's unnerving at times. Nevertheless, I can't help but recall that nameless man who came to our door each summer. Why, he was like some bird, some migratory bird. We never knew his name. He would just show up. Miss Monaghan, he would say, my stay on this island is not complete without stopping by this house. It epitomizes to me the charm, the mystery, the old history, all here in one spot. Why, I am so happy to be able to remember that nameless man because I've, so many of his memories are coming back to me. And just as I was writing my memoirs, I wanted to go up into the attic and I found this vintage suitcase that we had on our trip to Europe. Mother always liked to travel first class and on the canard line, there was only first class. 
and we were such a privileged family. I know we were very lucky, but mother taught us a lot about traveling and how educational it was. Why, I remember when Jay, my brother, my younger brother and I were walking on the deck on shipboard and he said to me, Hannah, look at that woman smoking a cigarette. <laughs> we had never seen a woman smoke before. And he whispered, she's a countess. <laughs> well, I've seen more than one countesses, but she was very special. Now, mother was a Quaker. Mother, when she was five years old, had a most amazing experience. They used to call them traveling friends. And one day, one stopped by her house, a wonderful woman in a long, sweeping black dress. Mother didn't know anything about who she was, but she was told that she was a coffin from Nantucket. Her name was Lucretia Mott, and she gave mother this handkerchief, and we have it till this day. It was 12 foot, 12 inches square, and it was the pride of mother's possessions from the time that she was little. Oh, mother, she did teach us a lot. I'll never forget the time she took me to the store. No, shop. No, we never said shop, we always said store. She took me to the store and we sat down with two hats in front of a large mirror. And mother said to me, Hannah, Hannah, which hat should I buy? This one with the flowers on it, the silk flowers, or this one, this beautiful one. And I said, how much? Oh, this one was $35 and this was $4.98. And I said, mother, what about the price? She didn't answer me. She said, which shall I buy? Well, I didn't get an answer, so I didn't know what to say. But when a big box with a London mark on it arrived at our house with this hat in it, mother wore it for 10 years and she looked like the Queen Mary. I learned about Quaker thrift. <laughs> My mother was so clever. And then, well, Gertrude came home with a box under her arm one day and announced to all of us that she had just won a European travel fellowship. She was so excited she'd gone off and bought a dress for herself. Well, when she opened the box and mother saw the dress, which I seem to find in here, she found this dress. And mother said, that dress is a nightmare. Gertrude, don't you ever wear a dress with elephants, giraffes, and zebras on it in Paris. That will never do. Well, whether or not she wore the dress, I can't remember, but she did go to Paris. And when she returned, she was a mural painter. She didn't say artist, she said painter. We had a lot of artists in our life in those days. We were so lucky because art was so important to us. <sighs> there was a woman named Violet Oakley. She was the one that sent us to Nantucket to explore the wharfs and the cottages that Florence Lang had here, which were very inexpensive and she rented to artists like us. But I'm getting a little ahead of my story because there was an episode just before we left for Nantucket that turned our world upside down. I'll never forget that day. It was raining, as they say, cats and dogs, and I was taking a friend of mine to a junkyard where I love to go to find treasures. This friend kept saying, I don't know what you girls see in these junkyards. Well, the rain was coming down and I was beginning to wonder if we saw anything either. And I was walking through this pile of debris and my foot just stepped on a broken beam and these gates rose up in front of me, these 12 foot gates like a pine tree between scrub oak. I was dazzled. I couldn't believe them. I knew I must have them. Well, because it was raining so hard, the man who owned the junkyard was in a little booth and he was cross-eyed and he had a cane and he, I asked him to please come out. I was so excited. I wanted to buy these gates right away, but I wanted to pretend that I'm, I didn't really, I wasn't that anxious. So I, I always carry a measuring tape with me. I started to measure the gates. And I said to him, um, can one buy these gates? He looked at me, but he gave me a, a dazzling price. And I thought, oh my, I'm going to play for time here. But I couldn't. I just wanted them so badly. So I, I had some money in my pocket and I handed it to him and I gave him a piece of paper and I said, we'll send for them. We'll take them. 
And I looked at Gertrude. We both didn't know what we had just done. 12 foot high gates, where are we gonna put them? No place to put them. Very little money left in our pockets now, but we knew their beauty would be ours. As we drove home in the rain, the windshield wipers just went creak, crack, creak. No place to put them. I know I had no place to put them, no place at all. But here they are, their beauty was ours. <laughs> now, when you have a house like this, or a barn that was going to become a house, one needs to buy things for it. One needs to buy the treasures that one will love and, and will be part of the possessions of this house. I used to go to auctions, but before I learned how to bid, I would go and practice. But sometimes things happened that I just wasn't sure what was going on. I would stand at one, sit at one auction, and there would be something that would come up on the black dais, and then it would be gone, and I hadn't had a chance to even bid on it. Well, I started to learn a little bit more. I, I, I tried to wear this dress to look inconspicuous when I went to the auctions. This little frock I picked up, just a little summer frock, and made me look inconspicuous, I thought. Well, one auction, I really wanted these six golden pillars. I didn't know what to do, so I hid myself behind a stove. Gertrude wasn't with me, and I felt a little bit exposed, but from there I could watch the auction floor and I would see the bidding. And this man came in and I knew he had a lot of money, and he had a little, a little funny-looking man with him, and he said to the man, buy these, and he pointed at my six golden pillars. I was heartbroken. Well, I was behind the stove, and I watched the building go up and up, and when it reached the highest bid, I said, this is a game and I will play it. So I shot my hand up from behind the stove and the auctioneer said, sold to the girl behind the stove. They were mine, those six golden pillars, you can see them here. Ah, there was another incident which I'm so fond of sharing and that's about the Venetian plaque that's right above here at this door. Two black lions grinning at each other. I fell in love with it the minute I saw it. Well, again, I wasn't sure what I was doing and the plaques came out and disappeared. I was again heartbroken. I'd lost just what my heart had set their desire on. Well, the man who bought them came out. There were two of them and he came out with them and I ran up to him and I had a few dollars sticking out of my pocket, I'm afraid. But anyway, he looked at me and he kind of said, well, there's a sucker. But anyway, he said, well, lady, these things go for big money in New York, but my boss doesn't know there were two of them, so I might sell you one. And he did. <laughs> As I walked by, I thought I saw the lion wink. I learned a lot. Oh, we had so much fun in this house when we were growing up and being actors and writers and well, I just love to play act and I just love theater so much. While my, Gert my sister Gertrude was painting, I would practice doing different roles from different actors. I loved Charlie Chaplin and I loved a man named George Arliss who wore this wonderful, you see, just a little bit like my headdress. I still can point a little bit, just a little, but you know, at my age, it gets a little bit more difficult. But I have these souvenirs and these memories that just keep floating before my eyes like those soap bubbles, so colorful, so beautiful, like these beautiful gems on this hat. Oh. Oh. Well, now I have something special which really brings back very young memories for me. This silk dress. Did I mention I had a 16 inch waist and I had a long braid that went down my back I was the brightest girl in my class. I think I told you I was a valedictorian. And this dress was very special for me. I remember when mother bought it, made of silk. When I wore it, I recited that poem by Shelley. To me, the last lines hit the mark. For love and beauty and delight, there is no death. When Hannah closed her eyes for the last time on Christmas Eve in 1972, I trust she had a smile on her face, knowing that her house was in good hands and her legacy intact. I hope she was pleased 
with all that she has accomplished here, here in this one spot. I know I am, aren't you? Thank you. Shake, rattle, and roll. <laughs> okay. So, thank you, Beverly. Um, I just had a few questions for her, so I thought we'd start with our little uh, little chat here. So, um, I, I I really want to know where the concept, the original concept to portray Hannah, where did that come from? Well, I fell in love with this house in the '70s. I never met Hannah, but I was walking by and. It, caught me by surprise when I came into this house and I took one look at it. It was a little bit shabby, but I said, oh, I'd love to have a house like that. And then we were doing the uh, renovation, they were doing the renovation of the house in 2009 and I was on the committee to help bring it alive, so to speak. We were, the NHA was restoring it and we were planning a program with some artworks and other things. And I thought, let's bring it alive with Hannah the owner. If I can't own this house, I'll just pretend to be the owner. <laughs> so I started pretending to be the owner. And then suddenly I, well, I wasn't the owner, but I sort of stepped into her shoes and her persona started coming through me because so much about Hannah and so much of her life seems to parallel my own serendipity, um, divine mind, her spirituality, my Episcopal, cradle Episcopal roots with her Quaker Roots. We aren't so silent in the Episcopal Church, but neither was Hannah, by the way. She was a little uh, five feisty feet of Quaker dynamite, I call her. Mm -hmm. But um, I just fell in love with her, and I started to read her memoirs, the, the book, and also her book on George Fox, which is quite a scholarly tome. Mm -hmm. And this book, this little book on greater light, just had so much, so many meaningful ideas, and, and Hannah's thoughts about memory and time, and, and art in particular. Art mm -hmm. is one of my passions as it was hers and Gertrude's. So. Well, so, but you talk about your Quakerism and we think of Quakerism as something that is austere, simple, un, unadorned. Hmm. And this house, this surroundings, her personality mm -hmm. is anything but that. So can you speak to that a little bit and yes, how I can. they can yeah. reconcile those and, things? And I put that in the script today actually, because the Quaker upbringing that their mother encouraged was a little bit less de decorous, but the girls persisted because they had a passion for cast off cultural things from the past, the junkyard, the, the gates, the, the sofas, um, anything handmade, anything handmade, they believed that the divine mind, the creator imbued the spirit with, because the Quakers believed that there was no difference between your life and your work. It was all spiritual practice. It was all done with faith mm -hmm. and guided by the inner light. So they, their time here, they moved here when, in the 30s? Yes, the South says, says 1930, they right. came here in 29 during the Depression. So they were part of the Nantucket Art Colony, I would assume. They were, and I mentioned Florence Lang, who had the cottages down on the wharf, mm -hmm. Commercial Wharf and South Wharf, where I had a cottage at one time, right. or an art school. And they came completely unexpecting. They didn't know what to find here. Mm -hmm. They had this recommendation from Violet Oakley. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the artist colony was just beginning and thriving. And this house basically brings a, a picture of the art colony, uh, mm -hmm. the early art mm -hmm. colony. I mm -hmm. think that's one of the reasons why it's such a prominent NHA property. Mm -hmm. So what about their life in Philadelphia? How did it mirror? Like, were they, were they here all summer? They were here all summer. Okay. And then they went back to Philadelphia in the fall. Okay. And um, they lived in an area called Powelton. They had another house there, which a <laughs> story about a woman who actually was is in that house right now, which has been cut into five different apartments, but the Monahans were sort of an eccentric group. Um, and they had decided that they would make one of the rooms in that house into a studio. And when the person entered it, they said, is this a studio or a chapel? Mm -hmm. They always had that extra sparks and that little touch of the divine and the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, they also went to Bucks, um, Bucks County. Mm -hmm. yep. and Philadelphia was very hot in the summer, which is one reason why they came here. Um, but mm -hmm. Philadelphia was a part, oh, the big thing about Philadelphia is Gertrude's murals are still to be seen. Now, wow. my dear friend Julie Jensen isn't here to tell you all about them, and she will tell you if she's here. <laughs> um, and they are in an old um, building, I'm not the Jacob Reese building, or is anyone here from Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. But it was an old, C it is, was a CVC, or is a 
CVS, that's what I mean, CVS. And, and, Han, and Gertrude's murals can still be seen there. Oh, wow. Yep. So, but, but this house, I think the, the longer that I've been around this property and the house and the surroundings, I find that they are your typical artists. I think of them like a New York artist, how they go into derelict spaces, loft spaces, and they make them their own and they transform them. And I sort of see this as a barn. Mm -hmm. When you walk inside and you see the, the scale, which is no, no place like, on Nantucket is like this. That's and right. they've taken a derelict property and done, they've transformed it like every other yep. artist yep. that we've known in, in an urban area, which is really interesting. Well, and they were the first preservationists, I believe. Mm -hmm. The carpenter that they had hired to do this property was Mac Paradise, his 10th um, daughter, youngest daughter, um, Therese Woodward just passed away about two or three years ago. And he had 10 daughters and he worked on this property. And when Hannah and Gertrude came to him with their design in a hat box that they kept, um, the design very close in the hat box on the, st in the steamer when they came over here, it took two days, they showed him their design and he looked at them and said, I could build you a better house. I can tear this down and it would be cheaper. So the fact that they didn't let him tear it down <laughs> was, is why we're all here today and, and we can thank them for preserving this. Yeah. They also had a house on Milk Street. It's called the Pink House, if anybody knows it. And Gertrude was extremely vocal in the local newspaper. And I found this when I went through some old I&M articles. And she said, why are the people of Nantucket so, she didn't say dull, but she said, can't they appreciate the thrill of architecture and the color, her passion mm -hmm. for color, because she was a painter, was, was, was dominant, obviously, and mm -hmm. the pink of the house, she believed, brought out the, the flowers and, mm -hmm. the, and the bricks and everything around it. So mm -hmm. it's there to still be seen. So if you could call out one particular thing about the property that you love, what, do you have a favorite? Well, let's see. Well, one of my favorites isn't here. Of course, the furniture has moved. Um, I do love the sofa that their mother, Anna, did, which was at the Winter Antique Show, which mm -hmm. was a really prominent place for mm -hmm. greater light and for mm -hmm. the Monahans, and I think they would have been thrilled to think of this beautiful orange sofa with the hand-embroidered scenes from their life here, done by their mother, Anna, mm -hmm. and Ger designed by Gertrude. And of course, I love that weather vane, which I yeah. had designed and, and created by a man named Ron Shepard on Nantucket, a mills, metalsmith, and that original weather vane was on the shed, which was behind that birch tree. I haven't told you all about the garden, but I know Mary doesn't have too much time for me, but I would tell you about that during the intermission or the next time you see me. But there was a shed there, and that weather vane, I saw a picture of it in this book, was on top of it. And I thought, what doesn't this house have that it could use that would bring it back mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. its own? Mm -hmm. Well, there was no shed, so we had to just design it mm -hmm. and put it right there. So I love that, too. Yeah, well, I... Oh, and the gates, of course, have well, to the be gate. Well, the gates. The, the, the gates, gates are, are kind of a gimme, though. My fashion. Yeah, I mean, Oops, there's, sorry. There's, my passion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the gates are spectacular. Um, but there's so many nuances around here that you have to look really closely and pay attention to the, to the detail of the things, like the kingfisher tile and the columns. And well, there's Hannah's a lot of bedroom yes. stands out for me. Hannah's mm -hmm. bedroom, there's a wonderful story about the glass on Hannah's bedroom. It looks like the bottom of glasses, amber glasses. Hannah and Gertrude were driving down a street in Philadelphia. I just have to tell this story. Yeah, I, I want to hear it. And they saw, the policeman directed them a different way. And they saw a tavern and they thought, oh, those are just the kind of windows I was imagining. And Hannah said, I'd like windows that would shut out the street but give beautiful light. And those amber glasses gave beautiful light. And a week later, they were driving by the same street and the tavern was being demolished. Well, those two girls drove their car right by where the windows were on the street, put them in the back of their car, five of them and drove off and they're here. Those were the scavengers with pocketbooks. Well, those are, those are the, the original pickers. They yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> Salvage. But they and... came from privilege and, and they just had this appreciation for cultural cast-offs and they mm -hmm. were just, mm -hmm. they, were, they were endless or ceaseless in their. Mm -hmm. So Beverly, thank you so much for bringing Hannah to life for us because not only have you, we've sort of peeked behind the curtain of her life, but also it's brought the house to life as well. Speaking of curtains, yes. there was one other thing that was in this house which I fell in love with because it was the original when I saw it. In 1970, when I first saw this house, there was a beautiful um, harem curtain. Yeah. 
a Mohammed Herod curtain, and now they've reproduced it. Well, it might be back one of these days. Mm -hmm. And these windows, these windows to me are classic, and they're so beautiful that my house has more greater light windows than greater light has. So where did these windows originate from? They came from a church. Okay, and in Philadelphia? Reason, I don't know if it was Philadelphia, but possibly. Yep. They went everywhere. They just didn't limit themselves to Philadelphia. But they, the way they hung them, they hung them upside down and upside down so they, they form together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, they're just fantastic. Yeah, it's really great, and, great And detail. I had Bill Murray, a carpenter, make them for my almost every room of our house. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So. It's true. And, and it, it looks like it's always been there as well. And they look like they've always been there as That's well. That's right. They very, yeah. they very much belong. Well, Beverly, thank you for okay. your five years of dedication. We look forward to many more sessions with Hannah okay. and her adventures out of her trunk. <laughs> and uh, Hannah's and, attic. And the other things that we can learn about her, but it's it's really, it's been a privilege to watch this evolve over the years that you've been doing thank this. You. So it's very generous. Any we audience love it. questions? Yeah, so does anybody have any questions any for Hannah? questions Hanna, from the Beverly? audience? Please. I can stand up. You can stand up. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> questions? Libby? No, I didn't answer my question. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> I wanted to know about the windows, and then especially that one over there, like the, you know, the, from the cabin. The ones over there, that's Hannah's bedroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, the Hannah's bedroom is a wonderful little room. Her um, bed is small. She was only five feet. Yeah. That's one thing we did not have in common. But she, it was a um, horse, tro horse trough, and they used to call it the Jerusalem or the Bethlehem bed because Jesus was supposed to be in a stable. So there's a co co her spirituality is everywhere here. You can just feel it the minute you walk in, I think. I still do, even if there's some weeds growing here and the house is all different, but it's kind of here. It hits mm -hmm. you right here. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I won't beg for any more questions. You could ask me about my props, because I have to tell you one story, excuse me. Hannah was very talkative at Quaker meeting. She never stopped talking, even though they're supposed to be in silence. But when I did a story, uh, a, a, a talk here for one of the groups of children that came from the Lighthouse School, I talked about my greyhound, Angel Gabriel, which was sitting at Gertrude's feet and was also in one of these rugs. Anyway, and the little boy picked up the fact that I was talking about my dogs. And he said, well, where's the water bowl and the leash? So there is a water bowl and a leash. And the last dog that Hannah had was a little Shih Tzu. And he was a little bit like this Ming sculpture. So we try to stay true to life. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're a good audience. Mm -hmm.